Well, all right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Bro. I'm going to have you guys scoot up because, like, uh, there's not enough people. Now, if we get a ton more people here, then you can go ahead and move back. But, uh, so, uh, Chris is actually going to teach part of the class today for us. Um, <laughs> actually, a funny story with that. I should let you tell it. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, we had an accountability contract. Russ was coaching me and my wife were a team, and we didn't meet the standards of the accountability contract. And my biggest fear is talking. So right now, I'm like, he's like, written I was like, going to say, you, what you didn't realize is I just kind of like put yeah. you on the spot to just do it. So. And <laughs> so that was my my uh, punishment as I've had. It was not, it's, I would, don't say punishment. <laughs> yes, it's not a punishment, it's the consequence. The consequence. Of what? <laughs> well, so my what, actions. Yeah, what he had said he was going to do some certain things as far as prospecting and things oh. go. And he said, if I don't do it, then I'll teach a morning ascent. So he's uh, going to teach morning ascent in uh, Centerville, and uh, we're all going to make sure we're Morning ascent, right? Luckily, I was at ascent this morning. And, I was the only one there. So. Well, 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 I'm going to make sure that everybody has to be there. So, yeah. It's, it's See, I just was giving a little practice run. I yeah. said, do a little bit of talking. And it wasn't. This doesn't count, though. Okay. This is not more than sense. So. Anyway. All right. Well, let's get going. So, wins or successes? What good things have happened since we met last? I just going to do contract. Woohoo! Good job. Awesome. Who else? I've got one under contract. Yeah, Liam's got one under contract. Awesome. Good job. Who else? Doesn't have to always be an under contract. It could be like, you know, like I actually called somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I have another one that's just approved. Another approved? Oh, yeah. awesome. Good job. Yeah. Tristan was going to say something. No? <laughs> no. You look like you were like thinking about it. So, I Paul. got uh, more thing with, uh, I work with Citywide. And of course, uh, from our side, the lender, lender side, uh, we uh, fortunate uh, came across an individual, and working with one of the agents uh, in uh, this regard, but uh, bringing about uh, a home purchase uh, dream to an individual that thought they would never ever be there, uh, and uh, we're going to get about 15 days, and we'll close this, and she is just absolutely elated. Because nice. it, uh, if she she never thought she'd get out of the get out of the hole. Yeah, it's awesome. because of her hard work. I mean, she's yeah. she's done it done it all. So yeah, it's uh, it's kind of neat and very fulfilling to kind of see that. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you for sharing. That. That's great. Good. Who else? Wins or successes, Dalton? What good's happening? Did you make? Were you just up making some calls? No. What? <laughs> Where were you? I was. I make calls at home though, from oh. eight to ten. Okay. Good. Good. Well, yeah, and just so that all of you guys know, I think most of you do, but 9 o'clock upstairs, we do from 9 to 10, we do the prospecting where we'll come around, listen to you, coach you, and, and help you out. In fact, uh, Dalton got his first appointment yesterday. Up there, right? So, did you go today? Oh, no. He, he was scheduled for the day, so. That's right. Yeah. Okay. At one. So. Awesome. Good. Well, good. Good deal. So, um, well, good. What? Uh, any um, other questions or anything before we... Okay, go on. All right, then. So I guess you had, I guess yeah. Steve's not going to be here, so Paul, you got to Yeah, I'm, again, I'm Paul Jolly, and I'm with Citywide just right across the lobby. Again, I'm out. Uh, there was a comment made uh, here earlier that, you know, you might have uh, some apprehension of talking with individuals. You know, I am really, really good at talking to individuals. I reach out up to 40 times a day on the phone in your behalf and with the individuals that I'm working with, the agents that I'm working with. And uh, I mean, I've got usually a, a headset clipped to my ear. And, uh, you know, if you're able to start a process, in, in, in most instances, I can help make a difference and finish it uh, by getting them engaged in the financial side and kind of guiding them through and bringing about, uh, you know, bring about a great end result. So if you're you're interested in uh, and you need a resource, you know, I'm a good resource for that, um, and I'm happy to do it. So just, uh, you know, swing by, introduce yourself, and I'm, like I say, I'm happy to, to help uh, get that done. I had a quick 
question. Um, what is the lowest credit score you can work with if someone's making pretty good money but their credit score is pretty? We like to work with six. I mean, you know, it can go below, but we like to work with individuals that are 620. What if it's uh, about 580? 580, you know what we're doing is we're coaching them. We're coaching them to a, a, a better end result because there's a couple things that go on with credit score. One is, you know what, can you qualify? Yeah, you can qualify under certain programs. But what's it going to do? It's going to cost you more money. And we're here to help get them to a point where it's less cost, it's uh, it's it's more favorable to a lender to give them better terms. But 620 is typically the you know the baseline that we work with. But if they, if they don't have it, you know, in 90 days they can probably get it because we're focused on a couple things. It, it makes a big difference when you're saying, hey, you know what, you can you can realize your dreams. Start paying your bills on time. Every month. Every month. Wow, just, that's a novel. Just make sure you're <laughs> making your obligations. Don't incur any additional debt. I call it a quiet period. Okay? It's a freeze period. Don't incur any additional debt. Don't add to your balances. Make your commitments on time. Okay? And focus and be motivated on achieving both of those things. And I'm going to check in with you every month. I'm going to ask you, how are you doing? It's a, basically an accountability to their lender. I'm wanting to work with you. And if you do that, within 90 days, you're probably going to lift your credit score up 40 points. It's just really that simple. But a lot of individuals, they go, ah, geez, you know, i got to have a car. i got to, ooh, i got to, <laughs> I saw this cool thing at, you know, Nordstrom's. You know, forget the sparkly things. Go in the quiet period. Let me work with you. Let's get you the house. And then once you get the house, then you can determine what you want to go out on the limb for. We don't encourage that, but we're focused on the home. It's the largest, single largest purchase you've ever made. And you got to be able to be in a position to have the discipline to do it. We can help them, you know, just by giving them some light coaching. They don't have to go to credit repair. They don't have to do anything like that. We can help them. By focusing on the fundamentals, pay them on time, don't incur any debt, any additional debt, and uh, just comply, comply with your terms of payment every month. Student loans, medical debt, whatever it is, it's all about meeting those obligations as committed. So, awesome. anyway, that's a long answer to a probably a short question. Cool. Okay, any other mortgage questions for City Wire? Okay. All right. Thanks well, again. Good luck to you out there. Let us know how we can help. We'll do it. Thank you. And then, uh, so Joe, anything from Vanguard? Uh, we're right upstairs. Um, we have 11 offices all over Utah from Centerville down to St. George. And there's a lot of us around to help. So I think most of you guys have my business cards. Um, I'll hand them around. My brother doesn't have them. But uh, does anybody have any title questions? I know that's kind of a tough. I, what are these days going to happen? Unless you have something, <laughs> unless you have something specifically happened that went wrong in a closing or something, mm -hmm. it's a little tough. But if you guys could think of anything, uh, just please let me know, okay? Cool. Uh, Joe Vanguard, thank you. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for being here. Okay. Anything else before we get going on today's class? Just like all kinds of enthusiasm. All right. We're good. Now, so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about needs analysis today. So um, I've got like probably three or four classes that I say this about. So um, you'll hear me say this a few times, but quite honestly, this class, so today and Thursday, this needs analysis really probably is one of the most important classes, if not the most important class that I would say um, you really need to make sure you really get and understand and, and uh, internalize this. So, um, like I said, there I've got probably three different classes that you'll hear me say that about. I'm like, this is one of the most important ones. But, like, this really is, like, one of the most important. And I'll say that about that one. I have three kids, and I tell them that, too. Like, you are, like, my favorite, right? <laughs> so, so, but, I know, just don't tell your brothers. So, um, that's kind of this, you know, don't tell the other classes, but this is, like, one of my favorite ones. Because I think, really, truthfully, for you, 
in terms of uh, your success in the business is all going to be come down to how well you communicate. And really, this needs analysis classes along the lines of communication. So, so I want to start with some basic things, though. And, and some of this may even sound a little funny to you. Let me get this started around here. But um, we talk about, in real estate, we talk about buyers and sellers. And, and part of the problem that I think we run into as agents is sometimes we get a little bit confused because we think that they're different. And, and in terms of how we meet their needs, they're different. But in a lot of ways, they're the same. And what I mean by that is, so you're going to hear me, uh, how we're going to do this is we're going to spend really a lot of today talking about buyers. So the buyer of a home, not the seller. But, but you're going to hear me refer to buyers. And, and when I say that, I'm referring to somebody who is really just buying your services. Does that make sense? So even though really we have sellers, people who are selling their house, they're really still a buyer of your services. Okay? Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Okay, so because of that, you're going to hear me say buyers, and, and what I don't want you to do is get caught up in thinking, okay, well, what about a seller? Because that's a lot of times after this class is what I'll hear from people a lot of times is like, okay, you know, I feel really good about it from the buyer, but now what about the seller? Well, when I say buyer in this class, keep in mind that includes the sellers because really the process that I'm going to teach you in is really the same for both the buyers and the sellers. We're, the way we go about meeting their needs is going to be differently, but the process is still the same. Okay. So with that being said, I want to start with what what do you think the top three complaints about real estate agents are? And this is a, an important piece of why we're going to do what we do in terms of this needs analysis. But what are the top three complaints? What what things would you think that people would complain about real estate agents? Okay, that is number one, actually. Believe it or not, that is number one is they don't, I'm going to say it a little different, but they don't return my calls. So they don't, not only do they not answer the phone, they let it go to voicemail, and then, then once it get, they get the voicemail, they don't call back. Have you guys found out already in terms of real estate? Yeah. Okay, good. Ryan, you have your hand up. They're pushy. They're pushy, okay? So that's actually not one of the top three, but that's probably number four, I'll bet, is because, yeah, you're right. Maybe they did something that maybe the buyer didn't approve of, or they didn't check in with the buyer before they made the move. Okay, so you're, you're close. So I'm going to call it, uh, I'm going to say it this way. They don't listen. So number two is they don't listen. So that's kind of where I guess you were going in terms of meaning like they don't check in. They right. they didn't hear what the client really wanted, so they went and did whatever. Right. And then uh, somebody else said something. Maybe. So what do you mean by that? Just communicating with the client. Okay. So I'm going to throw that in with the they don't listen, really, because I think that's kind of the same. So there's one more. Any ideas? Close. They waste my time. So the top three complaints that the consumer has about real estate agents. Number one, they don't return my calls. Number two, they don't listen to what I'm telling them. And number three, they waste my time. Now, ask yourself the question, and, and then I guess answer it for me. Why would they have this, ex I mean, the first one, obviously, we, we need to return calls, right? Obviously, and, and answer the phone, those type of things. But two and three, why would the consumer have the experience of we don't listen and we waste their time? What do you think? How would that happen? They're telling you that they don't want something in the home and you keep showing it to them because you like it. You think it's a good thing, but you're honest enough, you won't buy in the home. Oh, very good. Very good. So say that again louder. Did you guys hear what he said? No. Okay. So ultimately what happens is, and that is very, what you landed on is very, very crucial because that is exactly what happens is we take what our beliefs are, the things we like about a home, and we're going to then try to project that onto somebody else. So because of that, they have this experience of we keep going out and showing them these houses that really don't meet their needs because we like them instead of listening to them, right? 
So yeah, good, excellent. So essentially, that's what happens. Go ahead, Mel. Like the, I forgot what her name was, but she was talking about that she felt really bad to showing her client this house because she kind of felt like it was something that wouldn't fit them, and she, in her opinion, it wasn't a good house to buy. And so she showed her client that house last, and then they ended up buying the house and said it was perfect. And then she commented, "Oh, you don't have to buy this. We can go if you want." And I know you probably won't like this house. And then the girl, goes, "No, we want to actually buy this house." Yeah. So, and then she said she felt bad doing that, uh, and she wanted to kind of tell her client, like, uh, "I don't think you should get this house because of this and this and this." But it's really not her choice. Clients. Choice. Perfect. Yeah. In fact, one of the things you're going to hear me say, and then I'll come back to you. No, is one of the things you're going to hear me say over and over again in the today and on Thursday is, is it okay if your client buys the house they want? Yes. I mean, is that all right? Do you think that it'd be okay if they, even if you don't like it or you don't think that they should buy it, if they want it and they feel like it's the one that meets their needs, is it okay if they buy that house? That was not rhetorical. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So it is okay, right? Good. But, and part of why I want to make sure you respond to that is because, believe it or not, there are a lot of times that you as the agent get in the way of the deal actually happening because you're trying to convince them not to or to do something they don't want to do. So you had a comment for me. Well, the other thing I, I learned this last time, when we put in the contract, they wanted to pay 10000 less, and in this market I was freaking, and we got a response. So sometimes you just can't just listen to your guts. You know what I mean? Or what you've studied, or you just do what they tell you. Mm -hmm. I guess to a point, right? That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's just it. Is, is part of it is, yes, what, the biggest thing is what we want to do is we need to figure out, and that's what we're going to talk about today in class, is how do you figure out what it is they really want so that you can help them get what it is they really want instead of what you think they should go and have. So, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, so good. So then let's go to the next step. This is Kylie here to Sorry. take some uh, pictures. Sorry, it's for Facebook. She's going to post you guys all on the, our social we'll media you. site. Yeah. So. Yes, I'm going to get a paper and pass around roll if that's okay. I already did. Oh, you did? Where is it? I'll go back to my so But great. you got to give it back to me. I'll give it back to you. I'll just <laughs> okay. take a picture of it. Okay, you. yeah, that works. So, um, so good. Okay, so the next step. So, so first thing with, that we've got to have in this foundation that we're working on is is, is it's important that you understand this is the experience that, that most people have with real estate agencies. They don't listen and they waste my time. So what happens is, yeah, because we don't listen to what it is they really want in a home, we end up going out and showing them properties that don't meet their needs. Now, be the consumer for a minute. If you had an agent who you had said, this is what I want in a home, and I'm going to give you some examples of this one, and a ton of them, but you have just said, here's what I want in a home. They're going out and showing you what they think you want, but it really isn't what you want. And it keeps happening over and over and over again. What would you do? Okay, be frustrated and you would go find a new agent, right? That's exactly what happens is they go out and find a new agent. Then what happens next then, so if that was you, Dalton, so you had a client, you were showing them properties, they, they uh, get frustrated, which would never happen with you, but let's say they did, okay? So they get frustrated, and they go find a, no, a new agent. What, does, what is Dalton going to say, though, when he comes back to the office? Now, you guys may be too new to know this term, but we'll find out here. So what would, what would you say when you come back to the office and you start talking to the other agents about, yeah, this client just dogged me? What are you going to call them? Or what are you going to say about it? Well, why did it happen? Why, in your perspective, now we know theirs. Their perspective is you were wasting their time, you weren't listening, so they went and found somebody else. From your perspective, though, what are you thinking of them? Because you've shown them all these houses they said they wanted, but they didn't buy. They were wasting my time. I'm yes. just saying, yeah. They, yeah, they're wasting my time. Now, yeah, the term you're going to hear, if you haven't heard it yet, you probably all have heard it, but buyers are liars. Have you heard that yet? Yes. <laughs> okay. Do you believe it? Yes. Okay, and, and here's what I'm going to tell you is it's actually not true. That really, they really are not liars. It, here's the problem, is we communicate in such a way that what ends up happening is we end up not really listening to them, and so we assume we know what they want in a house when we really don't know what they want in a house. And, but, and because of that, 
They get frustrated because you're showing them things that don't meet their needs, so they go somewhere else. We come back and we say buyers are liars. They said they wanted this and that, and then they didn't. They went and get something else. So the two terms you'll hear is buyers are liars and sellers are storytellers. And and what I'm telling you is that really is not true. The problem is if we would just tell the truth and be willing to say, you know what, the issue was me and my level of communication with that buyer that was the problem. It wasn't them. And, and that's a tough pill to swallow, right? But that's what it is. So let me ask you a question. So we got to start with like the basic basics of this, okay, to, to get you through it. So I want to start with a question. Why does somebody buy? Now remember, this includes sellers, because sellers really just buying your buying into you as their agent is why what they're doing. Now, in terms of um, actually, since we've got a couple title people here too, this what we're going to talk about actually works for you in terms of with agents too, and I'll speak to you more about that if you're going to stay. If you're not, that's yeah. okay too. But, um, but I'll kind of tie them both together so you can kind of see because this can help you in terms of with an agent as well. So. But let's answer the question of why does a buyer buy, right? Value. They have to see some sort of value. Okay, good. So they're, they're going to see some value. Good. What else? They don't know the process. Okay, so they don't know the process. Okay, good. Life event. A life event. Okay. They feel like you understand them. No, okay, good. Can. Good. But, but from their perspective, why do they buy? So yes, meaning they'll, they'll buy from you because they feel like you understand them, but why do they actually buy? Why does somebody go buy a, a house? Or if it's a seller, why would they sell? But but let's talk just the buyer of a house. Why would they buy? Convenience. Okay, convenience. Good. I'm gonna come back to that one. What else? Investment. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. That's where I was headed to. And I was gonna get a bunch of answers, but that works exactly right. Essentially, what they're doing is trying to fulfill some need. So whether it was a family change. They need convenience. They want to make an investment. There is some need that's going on inside of them that causes them to then go do this. Would, would you all agree with that? Yes. yes? Yes. Okay, good. So ultimately what they're doing is they're going to fulfill a need. Now, how would you feel and how would you respond, and it's okay to disagree, but how would you respond if I told you nobody buys anything they don't need? True. Okay, Amy says it's true. Joe's shaking his head. No. What about the rest of you? What do you think? Well, they tell us when um, when we're prospecting, especially with like dispos, that you, it's possible to sell your home yourself, but the vast majority use an agent because of the reasons we talked about. Okay. Good. I would agree. So. I asked my wife. Joe's shaking his head no. Is so. it a want or a need? When she's okay. like, it's a great buy, honey, and I'll send you a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right? Well, that, that need can be defined in so many ways, so it really could be a need. It, you may want it as well, but that want becomes a need in your mind. Because we all want really nice things, but if we create them to be needs, like that's why we put pictures on a board to strive after because we in our minds want to create it as a need so it pushes us to the next level so that we're getting it we need this to show some sort of tangible result for our action okay good love it Don't i have to say people buy for wants too i i mean you see a lot of people have 10 different cars you know they don't need 10 cars people buy thousands of shoes and don't even wear them they just want to buy those things because they, I mean, they have the money. Okay. So that's okay. Good. Yeah. And then we'll come. I think it's an emotional support thing too. I mean, a lot of it has to do with emotions that they don't understand. Okay. Good. We're going to go there. So that's what I was going to say. I think there's two things. I think there's a measuring stick of need and where that need falls on that measuring stick, and the, the purpose that whatever the item is that you're buying will fill, and where it fits in on that measuring stick. A lot of us have a really short need measuring stick. It's a very narrow definition. And, but the majority of the world does buy things that they need, but it depends because their measuring stick is quite a bit larger. Okay, good. Yeah, so ultimately, so when I say nobody buys anything they don't need, the tendency that we have is to go to 
the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is we've got the, you know, meaning, and maybe not even necessarily Maslow's, but, but what are the things that we really absolutely, like, we need? Okay, we got to breathe, good. So air to breathe, what else? Food, shelter, you know, all of that stuff, right? Those are, when I say nobody buys anything we don't need, you guys are going to that. Meaning like, oh, we buy all kinds of stuff we don't need it, because we don't really need, I mean, we we don't need 10 pair of shoes. We really only need one, right, or, or whatever. And, and maybe we don't need any, I don't know. But, but at the end of the day, when we say, when I say nobody buys anything they don't need, you guys started to land on it, which is exactly right of like, like, there are going to be some just that are emotional. There's something going on that causes you to do that. Does that make sense? So somebody who owns 10 cars or 10 pair of shoes or whatever, what would be the need that they would have to do that? What? Yeah, Dalton's like, I don't know. I don't get it. <laughs> right? So I love football. Mm -hmm. And the Carolina Panthers, each day they several teammates drove a different car to camp, but they kept buying cars because they felt like they needed to one-up each other. They felt like there was that need there just to be the best or to be Perfect. on top. Now, they didn't need those cars like to survive, but they needed the persona. Good. So good. So Yeah, perfect. Yeah, exactly right. So there's some need, whether it's to outdo somebody. Sometimes um, it may be that we go shopping just to feel better, right? It's therapy, right? We, you're just going to make you feel better to go do it, right? So there's two types of needs, okay? So the next piece of this is there are two types of needs. Number one is there are real needs. The real needs which we talked about, food, shelter, clothing, all of those things, right? Those are real needs. And then the second type of need is there are perceived needs. So there are perceived needs, meaning they perceive that I need to go buy this other new car just so I can show up of, of wearing a or sh driving a different car, whatever. It may be I need to go do it because uh, everybody in my family owns a, a, that type of a car or whatever. So those are just going to be perceived needs. So meaning they're, they're not going to be something that makes sense to us, but it's more a, it, something underneath, okay? So which kind of leads to the next step here. So let me take you to the next step of this, okay? 10% of who you are as a personality is conscious. 90% of you is unconscious. Meaning, well, what, what do I mean by that? 90% of, of you as a personality is unconscious. What, what does that mean? You do things up out of it? Yeah, good. So we have cer there's certain programming. That's probably the way, the way of saying it is we all have this programming that has gone on from when we were very, very little all the way up that where we've been programmed. So, for instance, you've got things that you do at an unconscious level, you don't even realize that you're doing it. And only 10% of who we are is actually conscious. So 90% me. How many of you have ever had the experience, uh, by a raise of hands, that you got in a car, you drove somewhere with somebody, and then when you got there, you have no recollection of the drive. But you got there safely. If you can relate to that, raise your hand. Okay, good. So, how did you get there? How did it happen? Because you sat there having a great conversation with a friend the whole time you were driving, yet you got there. How did it happen? Autopilot. Yeah, what happens is we pre-programmed the brain. We told ourselves, here's where we're going. We got in the car. You, either you've done it a number of times or whatever, and you just had it programmed. So most of what's going on is you're, we are on autopilot most of the time. Okay. So 90% of who you are is, is unconscious. 10% is conscious. Now, here's the other piece of that. Part of this, when we think about how the brain works, we're going to talk a bit about how the brain works today. Part of when we think about this, 10% of who you are as a personality is, is conscious, meaning it's logical. Okay. So this part of our brain is where all the logic is. This is where we do things because it's logical. Make sense? Down here is where things are illogical or let's maybe say it in a different way is more emotional to use. I think that's the term you use, Leon, right? Is it's more of an emotional thing. Now, what happens though is here's where the problem. Now now remember what I said people say buyers are liars and it's not really true. Here's why. What happens is we communicate at this level, but we make all of our decisions down in, in here in this unconscious level. So we communicate here, 
but we make these decisions down here. And so what happens is when you sit down and you talk to somebody and you were to say to them, and I'm going to have you guys do, write this down in a second, but you were to talk to them about what they were looking for in a home, what, which of these two do they speak to you from? But when they're talking to you, though, they, they, the, let me see, I, I asked that question poorly, I think. <laughs> so, when we are defining and telling somebody what we're looking for in a home, we're going to use this. We, yet we buy down here. Let me, t let me show you what I mean by that. Is, well, in fact, let's do it right now. I want you guys to write down three questions. So let's assume, let's assume that you met me today prospecting somehow. doesn't matter. Whatever it was. You've met me. I'm a buyer of a house. So I'm going to buy a home. You set an appointment with me to come in and meet with you at the office. I'm now here at the office. We're sitting down at a conference room, whatever. We've exchanged pleasantries. So we've chit-chatted. We've done all that. You've asked me if I want a drink or whatever. We're ready to start talking about the house. What? I want you to write down the first three questions you ask someone that helps you know what they're looking for in a home. And I'm going to demonstrate to you and show you what this looks like. So write down three questions that will help you understand. While you do that, I'm going to erase this. No, you're fine. Okay, so who's willing to share their questions? So what are you going to ask that's going to help you know what I'm looking for in a home? So what are your must-haves? What are your deal breakers? And then what do you want your home to feel like? So when you walk in, do you want it more of that spacious? Do you want it open? Do you want it, um, more of like the closed-off feel where it's very personalized? And Private, like what's what's kind of your thought when you go into your home? Okay, good. Who else? Go ahead. What areas do you want to live in? Okay. Okay, good. Who else? Where, price, and size. Where, price, and size. Okay, good. What else? Who else? Wants it? I would ask what it looks like. What does it look like? Okay. What is your time frame? What's my time frame look like? Okay. The How others. Many bedrooms. How many bedrooms? How many baths? How many bedrooms? How many baths? Okay. Good. That's typically what ha what you guys have said is what we typically will do. Now I'm going to show you in a little bit here an exercise where I'm going to have you come up, somebody come up and we're going to I'm going to show you do a visual demonstration of what our communication looks like to show you what this looks like and what how really what the the problem is we talk at this level but we buy at this level. Okay, so we speak at this level and remember the reason we do this is because this is what. This is what's logical. This is what we think, what the customer thinks we want to hear. What they think we want to know is here. But what we really want and need is down here. So when I say to you, um, if, if you had a client, so let's say that you had sat down with a client. They had just come through and talked about what, what uh, or excuse me, you just sat down and you've asked them these questions you've talked about. Okay? They answered and said, I want a home that is high on a hill with a view of the city lights. Okay, So the client has come in and they've said, I want a home high on a hill with a view of the city lights. That's logical, right? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. You would understand that. Okay, So you go to work, you start going to showing them homes that are high on a hill with a view of the city lights. You keep showing them houses after house after house after house. They don't buy. Now, in the meantime, there's another home that's over here that nestled down in a canyon. No view of anything except for trees. Okay? They go on their own to find that house, and then they call you and say, Tristan, I found the perfect house for me. It's down here in this valley, and it's got all these surrounded by trees. 
Now, Dalton's shaking his head. What are you going to say? What's the term? Your yeah, you're going to be prior to, because why? And why would we say that? So, yeah, because that's what they said that they wanted was a home high on the hill in view of city lights, right? So let me ask you a question. Did they buy what they originally wanted in the home? Yes. Yes. So I, I, I have a couple of yeses, and I see some heads shaking no and heard a no. So they did or didn't? So those who said no, who said no? Or shook your head now. Okay, so we, why? Tell me why. There's no city lights. Okay. First and foremost. Okay, and that's what they said they wanted, right? Yeah. And Dalton, why do you say well, they, they didn't they said they didn't want me. It's on, it's on a hill. Yeah, it's not on a hill. It's in a canyon. Yeah, so they, it is not what they said they wanted. So Amy, you said yes, they did yeah. buy what they wanted. So how, so how could that be? Well, I would never take a buyer without understanding their motivation and what they want their home to be. And just telling me it's on a hill, looking at sea lights, doesn't tell me anything. All that tells me is that maybe they want to be secluded. That's it. Okay. And so that's what I'm saying. Yeah, they absolutely did because they're not going to go for that home in the in the canyon, covered by trees or surrounded by trees, unless that was what they were really looking for. We have to find out our buyer's motivations. You can't just get a list of must-haves. You have to find out a, a why. Good. Why perfect. Want that. Good. Yes. So essentially, let me rephrase what she just said. The problem is we speak here, but we buy down here. So did, because really that was a little bit of a trick question. Yes, they did buy exactly what they wanted. So what was it that they wanted? Now, so let's back up for a minute. Now, be a buyer for a minute. Pretend you are the buyer that wants the home high on a hill with a view of the city lights. And then I want to hear from each of you, why would you want that? So what, what would be the reason behind why you would want a home high on a hill with view of the city lights, Chris. Mm. Be away. Okay, get away from people. The view. The view. Seclusion. Seclusion. And you can repeat an answer. It's okay. Uh, yeah, mine was going to be the seclusion. <laughs> but 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 make it like think about it for a second. For you, for real, what would you want a home high on a hill with view of the city lights for? I think prestige. Prestige, right? good. I heard the view of city lights. They wanted a view. Okay. Kirsten? Mm -hmm. Why do you want a home on a high on a hill with a view of city lights? Uh, She's like, I don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> but if you did. Yeah, the Okay, so no floods. Good. No, I like view. 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 Feel like a big shot. Okay, so good. To so feel like a big shot. Good. Zach? View. Okay. What's your view? Amy? Location. Okay. I was going to say just keep away from the stress of Okay, stress of the city, good, right? You can look down at everyone. You're not having people right next to you being able to look into your house. Okay, good. So privacy now. Okay, good. Scenery. Scenery. Okay, so what you're seeing. Now, stop for a minute and let's think. Of all those things that you just said, most of those could could you get that same thing from a from a home nestled in a canyon? That was surrounded by nothing, but not, you couldn't see anything but trees. Yeah. Now, obviously, the ones who said they want to see the city lights, obviously, that if, if the city lights is important, that's not going to work, right? Yeah. But, but what would be those who even just said the view? Could the view of trees be good enough for somebody? Yeah. Good. So, what about prestige? Could you get prestige? You yeah, said right. prestige. Yeah. So, and all of the, all the things you said, privacy. Somebody said, so Ryan said privacy. Are you going to get privacy from a house surrounded by nothing but trees? Yes. You can't see. So, did they buy what they really wanted? Yes. See, now here's the problem: is we look at it and we say no because we think, well, that's not what they said, right? Which part of what, um, as we go through this process and we work on this, women are going to typically do better at this than us men. Sorry, guys, but that's just how it is. <laughs> and part of it is because if you think, if you go back in time, like anthropologists would say, what what was the man's job, you know, 500 years ago? What was the man's job? Hunter-gathering. Yeah, to be the hunter and gatherer, right? What was the woman's job? To be the nurturers, right? So part of why women tend to do this a little easier is because they're by nature more nurturing and want to hear a little bit more. 
us guys, our job is hunt and gather. We want to go kill something and bring it home, and we don't want to talk about, well, we do like to talk about killing things, but yeah, we don't want to talk about all the other stuff, right? We, I mean, for us, it's like, you know, women, you want to start talking about, you know, let me tell you what happened today, and what does the man want to do? We want to fix it, right? You don't want it to fix us to fix it, though. You just wanted to let us hear about it, right? See, that's the difference between us being hunted. We tend to be, which so I'm not surprised, no offense, Dalton or Joe, but no offense or surprise that when I say, do they buy what they wanted, typically the men will say, no, they didn't. They said they wanted a home high on the hill with a view of the city lights, and I'm not surprised that Amy, being a woman, says, no, they did, because really what they wanted was the feeling that they were going to get from that, right? So we, we, we need to be a little more nurturing as we go through and do this, okay? So now, with that being said, that next step, and then we can start to get into some of this, is I looked up um, not long ago to see, like, the most stressful events in a person's life. What would you say that the, and there's five. I've got five off of this website that says the most stressful events in a person's life. What would you guess they are? Death, divorce. Okay. Yeah. Divorce. Death. death. Marriage. So actually on death, we could probably say either plus or minus, and I guess maybe even somewhat with divorce on that of a family member. Yeah, and in, in divorce we just wish they were dead, right? So what well, would be number three? So I'm going to throw that in here as this plus or minus of a family member. So birth or the death of somebody good. What else? Moving. Okay, good. Moving. What else? New job. Perfect. That's this is I'm putting them in the order too. That they are. Job could be plus or minus as well. Yeah, that's true. Could be either a new job or losing a job. Perfect. Which could then lead to number five actually. Selling a home, buying a home. We'll put that as part of moving. Financial. Perfect. That's exactly what it is. Financial issues or so bankruptcy, something like that, right? Okay. Now let me ask you a question. How many of those are we involved in? Like not like all at once. I mean, like I'm not suggesting we have all five of these in one transaction. That'd be pretty messy, right? But but all of them, right? I mean, obviously this one every time we're we're involved with it, that they're moving. And what's causing the move? Well, it could be a divorce. could be somebody dies. could be they had a new kid. They need a bigger house. It could be that they got a job transfer or they lost a the job. They got a new, a better job, whatever. Or there's financial issues. So the five of the most stressful events in a person's life. Now, let me ask you this question, too. Think about the people who handle these situations. Attorneys that are doing this. Morticians here, us, obviously. Job transfers are typically on these financial issues, attorneys. Isn't it a little bit curious that these guys all make pretty good money for doing what they do? And part of why that is, part of why you have the ability to make the income you do in this business is we are dealing with people who are in one of the most stressful events of their life ever is just moving in itself. But then typically, how many times is it moving because of a divorce, moving because of somebody died, moving because they got, whether it's a new job or lost a job, it's still stressful that uh, this is taking place, or these financial issues that they, they now can't afford the house anymore, whatever. So you are dealing with people in one of the most stressful events of their life. The reason that's important is re to remember what's going on. Most of their decisions that are going to be made are underneath. They're, they're underneath the, the surface. So when they show up, how many times are somebody going to show up and say to you right off the bat, uh, we're moving because um, we, we have to, we, we can't afford the house anymore, that kind of stuff. They typically are not going to say that right off the bat to you until they know they can trust you. Once they know that they trust you and you're safe, they'll, they'll reveal all this stuff. So you're dealing with people in one of the most stressful events of their life, and and most of this information is made based on this emotional decision. And so what we need to do is somehow bridge a gap between here and here is what we really are trying to do. Is we have to go from this, this 
to drill down into this. Okay, does that make sense? All right, let me check my notes here to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Okay, yes, yeah, so what, there's one piece that I left out here. So what happens is in this, when I was saying that they showed up, said they wanted a home high on the hill of view with city lights, did they buy what they really wanted? We, we, we decided yes, right? Anybody not okay with that? Or, or anybody struggling with that? that? That they only buy what they need, and that even though they showed up saying they wanted a home high on the hill with the view of the city lights, they still really got what it was they wanted. Anybody struggling with that? You're good with it? Do you believe it? I'm seeing heads nodding yes, so I'll take that as good. Okay. So what happens is, here's the challenge, is what happens is just as human beings, we communicate one thing, but we mean something else. So part of the problem that we face as agents is people will show up communicating one thing when they really actually mean something else. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, is somebody willing to take their free questions that they had and come up here and do and interact with me now? Don't everybody volunteer at once. All right, come on. Yeah, hit them All right. So now watch what, watch what I want you to do. We're going to do it. We're going to play a game. Okay. And this game is going to be called Passing the Baton. So um, what we're going to call this a baton, okay? So like we're, we're going to do like the Olympics that are getting ready to do some of these relay races. We're going to do that, okay? Not really, but. So um, we're going to do this passing the baton. So the only rule of the game is the only person that can talk is the person holding this. So why I like to do this, this gives you a visual demonstration of what happens in our communication, what it looks like. So watch what happens as we do this communication. So we've, we, I've been to your office. We sat down. We've exchanged niceties. We're now ready to start talking about the house. So I'm going to hand him the baton. He's going to start to ask me questions and watch what happens. So you're the buyer, I'm the buyer. Oh. Yes, I'm the buyer. <laughs> okay. okay, so tell me what you want in a home. Um, first, I need to know the specifics like bedroom, bathrooms. Is it a two story or one story? So give me some specifics on what you want. Um, probably a one story. Um, you said bedrooms, bathrooms. So uh, probably like four bedrooms, bathrooms. Four-ish. Okay. okay, and does it have to have a garage? Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, is it a uh, two-car garage? Does it can it be a carport, or does it have to be a full-on garage? And, and how many spaces does it need? Uh, I want a four-car garage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So do you absolutely have to have a four-car garage, or would a two-car garage work? Uh, two-car will not work. I don't know that I have to have a four car, but two won't work, so I, I really want four actually. <laughs> and and where do you want to live? What, don't what, coach you. Don't know. What what neighborhood do you want to live in, and what's the price range that uh, you're looking to buy at? Uh, I want to just stay kind of in the same near area that we're in, and probably you know somewhere I don't know, under five hundred thousand. Okay, and how big does this house have to be? Um, what's the lowest square feet that uh, you'd be able to buy? Uh, probably 4,000. Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know what else to ask. Okay, good. Give, it, give it a man. Okay, thank you. So, tell me, so you guys have got to sit there and observe, and, and Dalton. Whatever you guys say, we're, it's safe, right? I mean, yeah. Because everybody, every one of you would have done something very similar to that. Okay, so give me what? Do you, what did you notice? What stood out to you in that conversation, right? It was all the logical things. It wasn't you were getting. There was no emotion in it. You gotta get some sort of emotion. You know, what's motivating? You know, I actually asked it. I say, what's motivating you to purchase a home right now? Okay, good. What else? What are the bedrooms? You maybe say well. What does bedroom look like? Well, don't, don't go there yet. I, I first want to just deal with like what, because most, all, here's what I will promise you. If I videoed you with a buyer, most of you are doing something pretty similar to that. They're all closed-ended questions. Okay, good. So one of the first things was that they were all closed-ended questions, which was what? Just really, a, I, I had a really short answer, gave back. What else? 
What else did you pick up out of that? Who was the pressure on? Yeah. Yeah, for what and what was it? What were you feeling as you were talking? I mean, granted, obviously this is a little different than if you're standing in front of all your peers. Well, I, I think just the, the closed end question where I, I couldn't get a lot out of you, so I kind of didn't know what else to ask. Because when you get a lot out of a you know a customer, then you can kind of come up with better questions and get dig into more information like the emotional side of something. Okay, good. Yeah, so typically what that's what happens though is now why does it happen that way? Let, let me show you why it happens that way. So um, then just do a little scribble on your paper right there. Okay, um, actually I'll write down just one line lower than what you're at. Okay, so we take the lid off your pan. Perfect. Awesome. So hey, Joe, stand up. All right, you can sit down. Um, now, sir, just change, adjust your glasses just a little bit. Okay, perfect. Now, why did you guys just do that? Why did you just do that? Because it was a direct order, basically. Okay. Why did you do it? Yeah, because pressure was on me. It felt like I had to. Okay. I just told us to. Are you going to do everything I tell you to do? <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Joe, how can we do it? Out of respect to you, Russ. Okay. Okay, good. I'll come back to that. So, why did you do it? <laughs> oh, so, for real, why would. Why did these guys do what I asked them to do? Go ahead, Ryan. You influenced them in some way. Yeah, but what, you're right. Why? Why, why did they do it, though? You're superior. Okay, good. So say that again. You're a superior. So, and, and don't, not in a negative way, but you guys have given me permission. That's probably the right way of saying it. You've given me permission to be in charge for the next <coughs> hour or so, right? You've given me permission. And so if, if because of that, if I ask you to do it, it must be important part of the process of what we're doing, right? So yeah, essentially you've given me permission to be in charge, and if I ask you to do it, it must be important. Now, what happens when you sit down with a client and they you start to ask them questions? What are they looking at you at? The authority. Yeah, you're the expert, right? And if, if, if Dalton is asking me about the number of bedrooms and the garages and all that, it must be important, right? So what am I going to do? You're just going to give him exactly what he asked for. I'm going to give him exactly what he asked for because I think, well, I don't know what, I'm not really sure what you're doing, what you're trying to accomplish, but you asked me how many bedrooms. Now, what if it's not important, though? What if really, like, well, well let's use garage because i got a great story for you on that. Let's use the garage. What, what if, for me, now garage is important, obviously, right? Because I was pretty specific on that, right? But what if a garage wasn't important to me? And he says, how many car garage do you want to have? What am I going to say? Doesn't matter. Okay, maybe I'm going to say it doesn't matter. Maybe two or three. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be probably given some type of a number, right? Mm -hmm. Now, now here, are you starting to see the problem here, though? If a garage isn't important to me, but he has said, how many car garages do you want to have? Or, for instance, he asked, what, what, the one that really kind of, and I don't know if you guys can sense it in me, but the one that kind of threw me a little bit was when he, like, how many beds and baths? I kind of had a number for bedrooms, but I was like, baths, hmm. Four. I kind of had to, like, make it up on the spot. Now, what happens, though, if that really wasn't important to me, what's he looking for? Four bathrooms. What if really I kind of made it up on the spot because it was important to him, but if I really like two would have been okay. Uh, whatever he's asking you suddenly becomes important to you. So because he's the real estate expert, you suddenly see a need. Oh, well, I guess if I, I need three bedrooms and three bathrooms, then. That's the only houses that I can suddenly look at is just three bedrooms and three bathrooms because that's what you said, right? That's what I need, right? I need four car garage. That's that's what I need, right? And it's it suddenly it becomes from a uncertainty to a yeah, I'm I'm locked in to this. This is what I need now. Okay, good. Yes, yes, yeah. and 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 us as the agent assumes that's it. That's what they need because that's what they said, right? Now. Um, for me, before I learned this process, so so let me back up for you. I, I actually was very first trained on this process that I'm teaching you right now back in 1999. So I started real estate in 96, first part of 96. 
1999 is when I finally got trained in this. Prior to that, though, if I sat down with the client, one of the things that I always asked them was, how many car garage do you want? Now, why would I ask that? It's because it's important to me. Now, remember we started this thing about, like, is it okay if they buy the house they want? Now, if a garage is important to me, if a kitchen is important to you, if, if the backyard is important to you, if you have certain things that are really important to you about a house, guess what you're going to ask your clients about? Exact same thing. I can specifically remember. Now, for me, this was prior to me being trained in any of this. I remember um, I would always sit down with the client and I would always start with like, okay, what style of home are you looking for? You know, and price range, and then you know, how many square feet, and how many bedrooms, how many baths, how many car garage do you want to have? That was always a question that I had. Now, I personally, this just don't don't anybody be offended, but personally, I would never buy or live in a split entry. I just don't like it. <laughs> I, I know a lot of people do agree, but but what if your your client likes them? Is it okay? Well, it needs to be right, but I, but what I'm telling you is prior to today, you're it would have had an influence if you don't like them. So I didn't like them, but I would always say to the clients, now how many car garage do you want to have? And guess what number they always would say? Typically two is what they would always say, right? So. For me, because personally, I would never buy a house without a two-car garage. So because of that, I always ask the client, what do you want? I can still remember specifically a client that they um, we have been out doing exactly what we talked about. Show them home, show them home, show them, no, we don't like it, we don't like it. I finally get a call one day, hey, we, we stopped and we're looking at one of the magazines that was at uh, the grocery store. And we, we just saw this house, we wanted to look at it. I said, okay, great. Well, give me the MLS number. They gave it to me. I jumped on the MLS. I pulled up the property. The house was a split entry with no garage. And I remember Dalton walking out of the office and walking up to Zach and saying, Zach, buyers are liars. They told me they wanted a Rambler with a two-car garage. And these guys just called me and said they want to go see. Should I even go show it to them, Zach? Yeah, 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 you should go. So I go, I'm like, okay, but I know they're not going to buy it because they already told me they want a two car garage. This doesn't have a garage. We go, we show up to the house, we go through the house, they're like, oh, we love it. We want to write an offer. And I'm like, how? <laughs> and then I come back, buyers are liars, right? Because they, they bought something they didn't really want. Now, so what really was the problem? The problem was I was not really communicating with them to really find out what it is that they want. So, there's got to be a better way, a different way that we go about doing this, okay? And what we want to do, so what we need to do is we want to do, in fact, somebody even brought up, when, and it might have been Leanne, when I said, why did you do what I said to do, what was, how did you word it? You get, I think she, she said something like, you gave me a direction or something. Uh, yeah, it's a direct order. I think. Yeah, direct order, that's what she said. Okay. Now, so think, now here's what you need to remember is, the way that your brain works, so we're going to kind of go to the next level of this. So we're going to spend a lot of today just kind of talking about the process, and then what I want to do is on Thursday is really work with you on the process. So, so, so the next step, so we talked a little bit about how 10% of who we are is conscious, 90% is unconscious. Now, the next step of this, is of how your brain works. Your brain stores information in three discrete locations. Now, um, I've also heard it that it's like, think of somebody's like, you've all seen like a messy desk that like you go and talk to somebody and ask them for a piece of paper and they can go to their messy desk and they know right where that piece of paper is. That's really actually truthfully kind of how our brain works is that's how it is. It's, we've got this stuff just kind of stored all over the place. But, but we store these things in discrete locations. So discrete meaning separate, okay? So when we have an experience, we process that experience and then we store the information in these three different areas. So what happens is we store the pictures in one area. So our pictures are stored in one area. Our feelings about it are then stored in another area. And the decisions about it are then stored in another area. So we've got, when we have an experience, we take this, we compartmentalize all this stuff. We throw them into these different areas, okay? So part of the problem, though, is when we want to go now access this information because 90% of who we are is unconscious, 
And, and so all this information is there, but it's stored in these discrete locations. And so what, what we need to do, what your job partially to do when you're sitting down and talking with somebody is to get them to reintegrate this information, to bring it back together again. So what we are trying to do is bring all this information and reintegrate it back together. When we do that, then we have something that's called crystallization that will occur. So when this happens, they will then have crystallized on what it is that they're doing. So meaning, so let me let me rephrase that for you and say it in a little bit more simpler terms, okay? Is initially when somebody shows up and you were if you were to start just by saying why do you want a house with a high home high on the hill with a view of the city lights, how would, would they probably respond? They're kind of just gonna go, well I, I just do. I don't know why. I just that's what I like, right? And the reason they're not really going to be able to answer that question is because this information is stored in these discrete locations. And until it comes back together, they can't really tell you why. Now, Kylie brought up, she said, um, when I asked her about having the home high on the hill of view of the city lights, she said convenience. So part of, I'm going to give you maybe today, but if not, it'll, it'll, it'll probably actually be Thursday, I'm going to give you. There's 15 benefit words that pretty much sum up what everybody is looking for. So so there are two parts. When somebody's looking for a house, it breaks down into two areas. There's the features of the house, but each of those features actually provides a benefit. And so what happens is people are not buying the features. So when somebody shows up saying, so for example, me, when he's asking me about the garage and I'm like, I want a four-car garage, is a four-car garage a feature or a benefit? Benefit. A feature. feature. Yeah, four-car garage is going to be the feature. But why would I want a four-car garage? What would be so crucial about the four-car garage? Well, we don't know that. So ultimately, what we've got to do in this process is we've got to go from this feature to what's the benefit. The benefit is going to be one of these 15 words that I'll give you actually probably on Thursday that I'll give you these 15 benefit words that pretty much every feature is going to fall into line with one of those benefit words. And until we land on the benefit, and they're not going to land on the benefit because the information, how they picture the house. See, so let me rephrase it even to you. Typically what happens is people will come and tell you a little bit about how they pictured the house and a little bit about the decisions they've made. So they'll, t they'll touch on these two, but ultimately what we've got to get to the feelings about it, the emotion about it, and until we get that and this crystallization occurs, we're not going to land on what that benefit is. And until you land on a benefit, here's the, here's the crucial, crucial thing. Until they have crystallized on the benefit, nobody is ever going to buy. They're never going to buy until they actually crystallize on it. So what happens is, well, in fact, let me prove it to you. How many of you have heard, and again, some of you may be too new for this, but I'll, I bet most of you still have heard this, or you maybe said it yourself. Have you heard, had somebody say to you, I don't know how to explain what I'm looking for in a home, but I'll know it when I see it. Yes. yes. Okay, that's a pretty resounding. Yet, yeah. almost all of you have either had the experience yourself or you've had somebody say, I'll know it when I see it. Here's what they're telling you, just so you know. What they're saying to you is, I've got all the information. I know what it is I'm looking for. I just don't know how to express it to you in terms that you would understand. So I'll know it when I see it. When they say I'll know it when I see it, what they're telling you is I've got all this information, but it's in these stored in these discrete locations, and I don't know how to bring them back together to be able to tell you this is what I need it for. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So with that in mind, where we're headed next is what we've got to do is help them to reintegrate this information. We got to bring it all back together again. And the way that we do that is through a process that we're going to take them through and it starts with we have to be very neutral so again on Dalton's questions that he was asking me were all very specific and again typically those questions are more about him than they are about me why yeah it's because why is he asking me the questions he's asking. Meaning, go back to me when I said I always ask somebody in the beginning, how many car garage do you want to have? Why would I ask that question? Something I would want to know. 
Yeah, because it's important to me, right? Yeah, so now here's the other thing. In terms of the questions that he was asking, yes, they were closed-ended questions. Contained in every question that you ask, whether it's real estate or non-real estate related, contained in every question you ask is an assumption. There is some assumption in that question. And that assumption typically is more based on you than it is on them. So, for instance, if, if I ask the question of the buyer, what area do you want to live in, what's the assumption? There's a specific area they need to live in. Yeah, there is a specific area and they know what it is. If I ask somebody, um, how do you feel about an updated kitchen? You know, what's the assumption? They want one. Yeah, my assumption is I would want one, so you probably want one too. Yeah. Are, you, are, you, are you starting to kind of see that's where the that's how we block this communication from happening. See, the challenge is we got to get this to happen, but the way we typically communicate, because we typically are more hunters and gatherers by nature, and, and, and quite honestly, again, going back in time, as women have more entered the workforce. It has both helped because it has brought some nurturing to it, but also the women have kind of learned a little bit of the hunter-gatherer piece too. We've kind of both taken on a little bit more of each other's role, but because we tend to do the hunting and gathering more, when you're hunting and gathering, this is you are not going to bring this about. Now, I, what I'm not saying is that you're never going to get anybody to buy unless you can cause them to crystallize. I mean, because obviously, so you've been there are hundreds or thousands of millions of homes sold every year that agents haven't been trained in whatever to teach you in. So the process happens, but typically what happens is they have to do it through what's called information loading. When you are at home tonight watching the Olympics and you see commercials come on, what's happening is these um, businesses are just information loading. They're trying to load you with information over and over and over again so that when you go to the store and you go, oh, I need some chips, oh, where's the Doritos? And the reason we think Doritos is because they've conditioned us to do that, right? So information loading happens. So how would it happen in terms of real estate for this to take place through information loading? What does that look like for us in real estate? What's information loading? I'll help you out. Say, so, go ahead, Sabrina. So Okay, good. Yeah, but for the client, sorry, I should ask that for the client. How do they information load? How do they get information loaded? By looking at houses. Yeah, they, and how many? Lots. Lots. So if you, here's another way I'm saying it to you. If you have a client that you are having to show hundreds or tens or 20, 30, 40 houses before they're going to write an offer, what they're telling you is they haven't crystallized. They don't know what the benefit is, and so when they say, "I'll know it when I see it." What has to happen is we have to keep showing them houses until they finally get worn down and go, this is it. Okay, So it's like the process has to wear them down and then they'll go for it. Okay? The flip side is what I'm going to show you today is uh, today and Thursday is how to take them through this process so they'll make a decision a lot quicker. So typically we want to spend 45 minutes to an hour taking them through this interview to where at the end of that, they should be now ready to go because now, instead of having to go look at a whole bunch of houses, they now become clear on. So, so let me show you what that looks like. What we're gonna use is, it, is instead of, we're gonna use typically how you've heard it so far is what's called open-ended questions, but, but we're gonna call them something a little bit different. I'm gonna call them a directive, okay? We're gonna use a directive for this, okay? The directive is more of what um, Dan said where, um, now, how did you say it again? I keep losing how you said direct it. Order. A direct order, yeah. It's Think of it that way, okay? So, and I'm going to have Dalton come up and I'm going to show you what that looks like. So, I'm going to, we're going to show you the, what the conversation looks like if we do it the way that I'm going to show you, okay? So, we want to use a direct, a directive is going to be something like this. It's going to say, describe for me. Or tell me about, or share with me. Dot, dot, dot. Okay. So the directive we're going to be, we're, and think of it this way: the brain, your brain works like a computer. In a lot of ways, your brain works just exactly the way a computer is. Meaning, on a computer, the way a computer works is it's programmed. You give it an instruction set, and then it responds based on that instruction. Very similar to what you guys did with 
for me, because you've given me permission, when I said to Leanne, scribble on your paper, she immediately went and scribbled on her paper. Because our brain works like a computer, okay? And if you understand that, you can then communicate with people to have it be a lot more effective, okay? So I'm going to do this again. I'm going to have Dalton come up. I'm going to show you how this directives work. So come back up, Dalton. Okay. So same rules apply. The only person that gets to talk is the one holding the baton. I'm going to add a couple things to this real quick. So I'm going to use three things you're going to see. Directors. I'm going to use something called prompters. And then I'm going to use something called positive feedback. Okay? So watch what happens as we have this communication. So same same concept, only this time I'm the agent, you're the buyer. Okay? So um, thanks for coming in. And Dalton, um, are you okay talking about the house and all that? Okay. So describe for me your ideal home. So notice I'm saying describe for me your ideal home. Um, I would like a, a pretty big house, uh, something that me and my kids and wife can enjoy. It, it would be um, a, probably a two-story house with a big basement. Um, I'd like probably a, a double entry that way. My you know, my mom and uh, some of her friends can live in the basement. Uh, I would like a big backyard for my kids to play in. I'd like a, a big driveway where I can put a basketball hoop in. Um, I'd like a pretty big garage where I can store my cars in uh, when it's snowing. Yeah, sure. Uh, that kind of stuff. Awesome, you're doing great. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a prompt. That's a prompter. Keep going. Okay, um, I would, because I, my kid is under five, I'd like a fence. I mm -hmm. don't want to run into the yard. Uh, I, I don't want to have direct neighbors, so I would want just a normal residential house. Yeah. Not a condo. Uh, sure. That's all I can think of. Okay, good. Now, so what, what's the difference? You can give it all my hand here. Good job, good job. <laughs> so he wants to keep going. Oh, I so, thought you were going to keep going with the tongue adopter. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. We'll talk about it more. So, okay, now give me feedback. What what did you know? What was the difference between what I did as an agent versus how when he was the agent? The buyers, huh? You recognized how important the family was to him. It's all about the kids playing in the backyard and the front yard having space inside. Okay. Good. Yeah, good. What else? You asked him the question, I would just let him give you all the details that you need to know what's logical and what's emotional for him. Okay, good. Awesome. It flowed this time, and before he kind of felt stuck. He could, it would just stop every time. So this flowed. You know. Okay, good. What else? He did most of the talking. Yeah. Yeah, who, again, who was the pressure on? Yeah. 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 Sorry, y'all, you can't win. It's on you every time, right? <laughs> so, yeah, notice that, though, that in that scenario, how difficult was that for me? I wasn't having to think up the next question. I wasn't having to worry about, like, anything. How much did I project onto him of what is important to me about that? Nothing. Nothing, right? I mean, now, remember, contain it when we ask a question, or in this case, even give a directive, there is an assumption contained in that. So notice, though, in this scenario, my assumption, when, by asking, describe for me your ideal home, what's the assumption? Just, yeah, th there is one, and he knows what it is, right? I mean, but, but that's probably a fair assumption, given that he showed up to the office to talk about what he was looking for to buy an house, right? So, but notice how I stayed out of the way. Really, I'm backing out of the way and kind of going, okay, you're important. So now, what I would have done, and he didn't do, he he didn't do it. Sometimes, what will happen? But are you okay coming up, Chris, and standing in front of all these guys? Yeah. <laughs> Since I know he doesn't want to talk in front of you guys, this we're going to do the same. I'm going to do the same thing again. So watch watch the difference. I'm assuming on this, and I might be wrong. But describe for me your ideal home. Um, lots of land. Four bedrooms, detached shop, two full bathrooms, four bath, rambler. Okay. 
You say, so typically what you want to do is, I, what I would do, don't, let's assume you didn't say that's about it. When they say that's about it is when you're going to stop, and I'll show you why in a second. But let's assume he didn't say that. I would go, hey, you're doing great, Chris, keep going. Just make some stuff. Big kitchen, data room. And if he hands it back, I'm going to go, oh, awesome, yeah, tell me more. So this is what the prompters are. So I'm just going to keep, it, every time he hands it to me, every time he stops talking and hands me the baton, I'm going to either say, keep going, tell me more, what else, in, any of that. The positive feedback. Did you guys notice when Dalton was up here how I was shaking my head like I'm like the bobbing dog in the back of the car? <laughs> So I was just sitting there doing that, and then every now and then I would go, oh, wow, interesting, hmm, oh, wow, that's cool, nice, oh, interesting, wow, hmm. That's the positive feedback. Why would we want to do that? Let them know we're listening. Yeah, let them know I'm listening, and you're doing great, keep going. So that's our, you're doing great, keep going, Chris, and then he's going to keep talking, and then he hands it back to me, I'm going to say, what else? That's awesome. Look at, I'm not really doing anything. I just keep asking him, what else? Keep going. Tell me more. Until he says, that's about it. I can't think of anything else. I don't know what else to tell you. Something like that. All right, give this okay. I'm slowly warming you up to being up in front of the, the clown series. So does that make sense? Okay. So as we as you are doing this with them, we, we want to keep using these prompters. What else? Keep going. Tell me more. Tell me more. Keep going. What else? Until they say that's about it. Once they say that's about it, we're going to stop. Why? Yeah, because what's it going to feel like if Dalton says to me, that's about it? And I go, no, keep going. Dalton. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know what else, you know, just, I don't know what else to tell you. That, that kind of thing, okay? So under this scenario, all I'm doing is describe for me your ideal home, and then I hand him the baton, and then I just be quiet and stay out of the way and let him keep going and telling me, and then as soon as he hands it back, I just say, what else? Now, why is this important? Why is it important that we do it that way? I feel like saying it, it takes you out of the picture, and it goes back to when you're saying, uh, well, tell me if you need a two-car garage. Maybe they didn't even care about that before, and now you just made it harder on yourself, because now you have to look for a specific house, and you're just narrowing your, your choices. So okay. I think that's good. Good, right? You learn some of the emotional factors that are in the decision. Dalton said he needed a backyard for his kids. Yeah. So now you know he has kids, and that's going to be a factor as he wants to make his kids happy. Good. Perfect. Good. Any other thoughts? Yeah. If you don't ask the question that way, then I typically then start to project what I want in a house upon them. And they may not want a third car drive, and they may hate granite. But if I don't ask those questions, I just assume that's what they want, and it makes it very difficult to find them out. Okay, good. Dude. I was just going to say, he, uh, he mentioned he wanted a single family home because privacy is important to him. So that, I think, is a Yeah, good point. So he already even started. Privacy actually is one of the benefit words. So convenience was one, but privacy was one. He kind of, now, that may not be necessarily what's driving this. But, but good point, is he started to bring up the benefits. So, so here's the key on this, is notice, now, here's what I'll tell you. We're just scratching the surface of this whole process that I'm going to show you in, but for the sake of just kind of where we're at in the process right now, what's happened is, is he has started to, by me saying, what else, keep going. So, Dalton, when I said that, What's going on inside of your, when I said to you, hey, you're doing great, keep going. I was just crystallizing more, so I was uh, just bringing up more of the decisions that I wanted, uh, my feelings, I was picturing what, what else do I need, so. Yeah, so what, what's happening is I'm forcing him, remember, because the brain works like a computer. So I'm forcing him now to go in and start to access all of this stuff of like, well, what else? And what you'll notice with the client is sometimes what I thought Chris was going to do, sometimes what will happen is I'll say, describe for me your ideal home, and they'll say, three bedrooms, two baths, two car garage. <laughs> and why would they say it and stop there? Why do most people, why would they answer you that way? Three bedrooms, two baths, two car garage, 2,000 square feet. Because they expect you as the agent to do something with that information. Okay. They, like you said, they put the responsibility on you. Okay, good. Oh, yeah, it's just like the common question that everyone hears 
Perfect. I'm going to come back to that. So there's a filter options on every search engine for homes. There, that's what the filter options are. So they're Good. giving you what they would normally check in those boxes. You're exactly right. And it, what's been their experience is you want to hear this. Remember, 10% of who you are is conscious. This is where it's logical. It makes sense. It all is. I mean, how many times are you going to have somebody walk in and be like, hey, Dalton, I want to buy a house that is just, uh, you know, really convenient and um, really private. I mean, you're just typically not going to hear that because we've conditioned them. They've been trained. Their experience with other agents is typically what we want to hear is the number of bedrooms, the number of baths, the number of square feet, the size of the lot, the where, you know, how the price range, all those things. But that's not where they buy. They don't buy that way. They're going to buy from down in here. And so somehow we got to bridge the gap to get down into that piece of where they're at. Okay. Do you find that the more, more you have with someone, the more likely they are to give you emotional answers to those questions? Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, how do we then build that rapport, really, is kind of the question. So, Dalton, how did, when you're standing up here and I was doing that, how did you feel about me as the agent? I didn't have to really, uh, I was more focused on what I wanted. Okay. Was it uncomfortable to, to talk about it? Okay. So why would they, why do you think, what do you think they're going to start to feel about me as the agent though when I'm doing that and saying, what else? Keep going. They Come care on. about. Yeah, they're good. Why? You're right. Why? Why are they going to feel that way? You want to find perfect home for them. And and I'm listening to them, right? I mean, I'm now when I remember I told you in 1999 when I went and did this. So now this is where I'm going to tie this in for you, title piece, okay? Uh, when I went down and was trained in this, it was a very small class that actually got, got trained on it. There were I think six of us. There were five or six, but there was me as a real estate agent. My broker was there, so she was there as a broker manager slash recruiter about how to use this for recruiting. We had a loan officer. We had a, a mortgage guy, and then I think if I remember right, there were two financial planners that were in there. So we kind of had the whole spectrum of, of different people in there. Well, as the, the lady that was training us in this, she had said to the loan officer, okay, I want you to be the loan officer and for me to be the agent. So I mean, it was kind of like a almost real scenario that we were, we were doing. And she said, what I want you to ask as the loan officer is, Describe for me the ideal loan officer. So the loan officer was saying to me as the agent, describe for me the ideal loan officer. Now, Rick, it's, it, you've been in the business 20, almost 30 years, right? If somebody said to you, describe for me the ideal loan officer, you got things that you would say? Oh, mercy. My mind goes very deep on that. Yeah, so for me, now even though I've only been about three years in the business, I have learned enough to know and, and you guys probably, some of you are probably figuring it out now, a good loan officer like makes the deal so much smoother, right? And so when this guy said to me, now this was in the Bay Area, so I was in, in, the, in fact, the company, anybody from the Bay Area? You ever heard of Olympic funding? No. Anyway, that, that's what the, the company we were sitting in, was this Olympic funding in the Bay Area. And I'm sitting there and this loan officer then says, Russ, describe for me your the ideal loan officer. Well, it's similar to Rick. I just like okay, they're gonna do what they say. They're gonna call me and keep me updated on what's going on. I mean, I had all this stuff to say. So at the end of that, I remember saying to the loan officer, "I wish you were a loan officer in Salt Lake because I would give you all my business." Now, remember how much did I say as the agent to Dalton? I didn't really tell him what I was going to do. I didn't tell him really anything. Now remember, we're only scratching the surface, but this loan officer hadn't told me anything he was going to do. He just sat and listened to me say, I want a phone call to know an update every week about what's going on with the loan. And I want to, you know, I just said all this stuff that I would want. And then afterwards, I'm like, I wish you were a loan officer in Salt Lake because I would totally give you all my business. Why would I feel that way? You felt like he understood you at that point. Yeah, 
Now, guess what your client feels like when you're sitting there? And remember, oh, I shouldn't have erased. Remember our top three complaints? What was number two? They don't listen. What was number two? They don't listen. What am I doing when I'm doing this with Dalton and saying, describe to me your ideal home? I just sat and listened. Right there. Well, I would like you to share your experience in California also with the other manager who you actually did this process purposely to see what the outcome was. You know which story I'm talking about? I'm not sure. Where she said that this was the greatest conversation. Oh, oh, I thought when you said in California, no, that was Vegas. That's oh, it's Vegas. That's right. Vegas. Yeah. Vegas. Yeah, so actually, what I actually did this, um, sometimes I will... I, I don't want to give away my secrets. <laughs> Sometimes, just for fun, I will kind of do um, this type of stuff, just like with people, just kind of for fun. So, yeah, what Rick's talking about down at the Superstar Retreat, um, Mike Perry was talking about the importance of asking questions. And so, we went to dinner, and there were some managers that were from the Troop Real Estate in California. Well, at dinner, I just sat and I just was like, so tell me about your office. Which, so tell me about your office. And she started to tell me, and I was like, oh, really? Wow, interesting. Oh, hmm, interesting. Now, so wait, where did that come from? And, and so tell me more about that and keep going. Oh, wow. At the end of the dinner, which we were there, you know, an hour and a half or two hours, something like that. At the end of the dinner, she got up, and as she was leaving, she shook my hand and she said, you know, that was one of the most enjoyable dinners that I have ever had. And here's the funny thing. She didn't ask me one question. <laughs> she didn't. I mean, she uh, probably, if you were to go to her office today, she probably wouldn't even remember like what my name was or anything. And, but I guarantee you, she'll remember sitting there at dinner and having that delightful. That was the word she used. Delightful. That was one of the most delightful dinners that I've had in a long time. But it was because all I did was this, and it, and it has them feel like. You really understand me, and wow, what a nice guy! And I didn't really do anything, but start doing it with your spouse, and watch what happens. You get a lot more cupcakes. Are you saying from the wife standpoint too, or no, no, exactly. Get more things done around the house. Yeah, that's right. All right, so here's what I want to do. We've got about a half an hour left. So here's what I want to do. So I want to, I want I want you guys to get a little bit of an experience with this. So so let me. Um, Tell you what we're going to do, and then we're going to break up and do it real quick. Is so what I'm going to want you to do is just do this piece. So just the, this directive of, of, of I'm going to want you to just say, describe for me the ideal home. You don't have to pass the baton, although maybe you should. I don't know. But but just your job as the agent is you only get to say, describe for me your ideal home, and then you can use the prompters. Which remember the prompters was keep going. Tell me more. What else? That kind of stuff, okay? That's all you get to say. Is basically think of it this way, visually, if they hand you the baton. So meaning like typically people will just stop talking and, and look at you kind of like when they're, that's kind of how they're without doing it. They're handing you like your turn to talk. When they do that, just hand it back with a prompter and keep going. Wow, that's interesting. Tell me more. What else? Okay? And then from there, and you're going to keep doing that until the client says that's about it. Or I can't think of anything else. I don't know what else to tell you. Make sense? So we're not going to take notes. Now on Thursday, I'm going to actually, we'll do it and I'm going to have you actually take notes. But for right now, don't take any notes. Just listen to them and and. Give them positive feedback. Oh, wow, interesting. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's neat. Wow. Okay. Does that make sense? That's all we're going to do. So I want you to break into groups of two. I don't know how many people. So if we have an odd number, I'll have Rick jump in and be one of the one of the buyers. But, but, so here's what I want you to do, though. I want you to get into groups of two, and then from there, so, oh, so, so for the title, you guys do it with them. Of describe for me the ideal escrow officer is what I want you to say, or the ideal title company, something like that. Now, they, some of them, depending on who you're with, may or may not know really what to say and what that looks like. But that's how you would do it with an agent: is taking an agent to lunch would be saying, "Okay, hey, Kylie, describe for me what you know the ideal title company would look like. What would they do?" And that does that make sense? Okay. So you break into the groups, decide who's the agent, who's the client, and then the Agent is going to, just make sure you guys know what we're doing. The agent's going to say, describe for me your ideal home. 
and then be quiet until they hand you back the baton, so to speak, and then just hand it back, keep going, you're doing great, until they say that's about it. Once they say that's about it, or I can't think of anything else, I don't know what else to say, then switch roles. So whoever was the agent will now be the client, vice versa. And then let's just take like five, ten minutes and do that, and then I want to talk about it. Okay? Everybody know what we're doing. Okay, find a partner. And let's see. Yes, I'll be your partner. As long as I'm ready. Yeah, let's see if everybody has one. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's it. I think it's Oh, okay, Yeah, I can do that. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. okay. Okay, once you vote, once you vote as a chance to be both sides, let me know.
Okay. Everybody good? Okay, so give me some feedback. How did how did you feel about it either as the client or the agent? It doesn't matter. Just give me like some feedback if you liked it, you didn't like it, what at the bottom piece. Whatever. It's easier when you're the agent. Easier when you're the agent, good. I definitely think it's a good way of asking questions because you definitely get that emotional tie. And when you get that emotional tie with somebody, then you feel like you know them and you have more respect towards them. Versus when you know somebody just asking you something, you just become another agent. But after that conversation, after you expose your guts to them, if another agent calls you, if you have another conversation yeah. with somebody, you don't want to go over all that again. You'll just say, I'm not interested, or I have an agent, or Thank something you. like that. Yeah, very true. Good. Yeah, because you're now that's just it. You do end up being connected with them. It's like I said, I guarantee you that lady that the manager from the California from the troop office is going to feel like we are like the best of friends and and it, you know and it, the funny thing is I she didn't doesn't know anything about me. I was going to say um, it made me think about like more of what I want in a home and it kind of gets you excited to like work with the person yeah because you feel like they can provide that. <clears throat> yeah, perfect. Which actually that. A, a good side note to this. So, so yesterday at Morning Ascent, George talked, or and uh, was the Morning Ascent base camp. We talked about SOI or I'm sales meeting. Sales meeting. Yeah. yeah, sorry. In sales meeting. So, as you want a good, good way to work with your SOI and kind of get started with your SOI, I think personally, like after Thursday, call them up and say, "Hey, I'm. I don't know if you know or not, but I, I got started in real estate, and one of the things that." Um, that I'm learning is some some new ways to do a buyer interview and and is there a time I could come by and just do a practice one with you? It doesn't even need to be real. I just want to come practice, pretending that I that you're a buyer, okay? And then I go sit down and if it's Tristan, I sit down with Tristan. I go, all right, Tristan. So look, just you know, assume that you're thinking about buying a house and describe for me your ideal home. And then she starts talking about it. what Steve said is so true is. If you did that with a number of people in your SLI, just hey, I just want to come on practice. Somebody's going to afterwards go, like, hey, actually, like, we probably should start thinking. I mean, they may not do it that particular meeting, but you may start them down this path of like, yeah, I am kind of frustrated with this or that in my house, that, and I wish I did have this other. You may start them down and get them excited about it. So when you say yeah, it gets them excited. Exactly right. Yeah, good. Yeah, what else? What other? It forces you to open up and put the shield down. Yeah. Yes. Be right, because when I'm saying, tell me more. Yeah. It, it, it forces them to really have to go, okay, well, let me think about it. Right. Well, that was the funny part. Cause, so I'm, I probably all of us described what our true ideal home was. And as soon as he told me more the second time, I, I started saying things that I didn't even consciously realize. And then I was like, yeah, I do want this, and I, I actually do want this. So yeah, so they weren't they weren't things that yeah. The, at I this thought. level, you don't think about it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You're exactly right. That's what happens. Is it forces now to start to have this all this reintegration to have all this information start to come together. Good. What else? What other thoughts? You know what's fascinating is the one that we did. I I described exactly what happened to me. What was fascinating is that I went deeper in the why of what I actually did, which brought out the exact thing that she should have been looking for in a property, the, the garage, the, the kitchen, what that means to me, and, and those kind of things. Fascinating how I felt about describing what I actually did. But she brought that out in a very easy, uh, way and she basically got the answers to the test. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Essentially, that's what we, that's what we're doing is we're figuring out what are the answers to this test that we're going to have to take, so to speak, of helping them find a house. Is they're giving you now all the answers that you're going to that you're going to need. So now here's the other thing: were any of you tempted to ask additional like? Meaning, remember I said all you can say is describe for me and keep going. Tell me more. What else? Did anybody get tempted to say other things? Okay, the album? Yeah, I wanted to know like the, the benefits of why you want this. And, I mean, you kind of wanted to ask, well, if they described the home and then you felt like they didn't answer what you needed, you wanted to know. So okay, good. Kind of going back to it's about them, not you. 
Okay. Go ahead, Sabrina. Then Amy. Then I like. I like to repeat and affirm so oh, that they know that you're listening. Uh -huh. no, it's powerful. And so that you understand. Okay, I do want a big kitchen because they had mentioned that. So yeah. you want to make sure that. Okay, you want a big kitchen. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. Good. So now, now what I'm gonna. I, what I'll show you on Thursday actually is is what we want to do. In fact, I'll give you a little precursor too. So I'm going to give you a sheet of paper that has boxes on it that are like this. Okay. Now what we want to do is so when we say describe for me your ideal home, they'll start telling us what about it, and we want to keep notes about whatever it is they're saying. So whatever feature they're talking about, I want to keep notes in here. And then if they go say to the backyard, maybe I start going over here or whatever. You know, I'm going to go across this way or down. It doesn't matter. None of these boxes are anything specific. It's just a place for you to keep notes and to try to keep everything they say about the kitchen in one area, everything about the garage or whatever feature they go to next. I want to keep all those in one certain area. And then what we'll do though is we want to we'll want to do a second pass on it where we'll come back and say, tell me more about the kitchen. So this first time though, we want to stay real neutral. Like Think of it this way, is how we're going to start out this process. We want to stay like as neutral as we can. Because remember, I, buyers are not liars. So we want to get to really what it is they want. And the only way to do that is to stay so neutral that, that all I'm saying is describe for your ideal home. What else? Keep going. Tell me more. Keep going. What else? Tell me more. So, so on the second pass that we do, then is when I would want to say, tell me, you, you mentioned the kitchen, tell me more about the kitchen. But this first time, even just stay back, don't even do that, just what else. And if they keep going on the kitchen, great, but if they don't, then that's okay too. So good, thank you. And you were going to say I was, was going to say, I asked about location, but it was actually on the second pass. She would say, okay, that's all, and I talked to her. Oh, okay, she gave good. me a whole lot of information, so sense. tell me about the because she had mentioned kitchen, so tell me about the kitchen. Yeah. And then she's like, okay, that's it. That's all I can think of. And it wasn't very much. I said, okay, now tell me about the location. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but I, I see why you wouldn't want to do that. Perfect. Perfect. Oh. Perfect. And then Ryan was going to say something that he left, so I guess. <laughs> so, go ahead. I just want to say the oh, yeah. same thing. Oh, okay. So good. So just yeah, that same concept. Yeah. So but notice that how, like, we're conditioned. We want. We want to jump in and start to ask more questions and start doing things. But remember, that's what blocks this from taking place. Now, over time, what, what you'll see on Thursday is we're going to slowly start to get to where we are. Gonna, you're going to get to ask. Well, here's what's ironic is like right now when you're doing this, you're like, I've got all these other questions I want to start asking them. But then when, once we get further down the process and now I'm going to tell you it's OK to start asking those specific questions, you're going to Time's up. <laughs> You're going to say to me, well, I don't know what questions to ask. That, that's what's kind of ironic, is right now you want to ask them. Later on, you're going to say, I don't know what to ask. So you had a comment before you stepped up. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, for most, at least for me, my wife tells me all the time that I like to talk. And so I like to hear my own voice. So when he was telling me what he wanted, I kept wanting to say something. And I had to refrain, yes. like even saying, OK, that's great. Like, yeah. But the more I just stayed silent, the more he felt like he had to keep talking. Exactly. And so I think I find myself a lot of times having to be like, I need to shut up. Yeah, force yourself. Yeah. <laughs> that, that no, that's so true. Especially in it. Rick's point in so, Yeah. That's so true in this process. The more you stay out of the way. Now, as I said, as we get into it, think of it as we're starting and we're gonna start drilling down to where we will start asking a whole bunch of questions. But but initially it's like I gotta just stay out of the way, don't interrupt, because by jumping in and asking a question then causes problems. So let me give you a quick example. In fact, um, Leanne said to me uh, while you guys were practicing, she said, I wish I would have done this with my kids or used it with my kids, right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Is this, what I'm, this process works just in everything, not just real estate. So my oldest is uh, 20, uh, yeah, well, he's getting close to being 21. So when he was though in elementary school, so not long after I had first learned this process, um, he's in elementary school, he comes home from school one day, slams the door, and just tells my wife, I hate Tanner, which is one of his friends. I hate Tanner, and I don't ever want to play with him again. Well, so 
and and I'm not like picking on my wife. She just wasn't trained in this. But she, <laughs> she, uh, which I I know I'm recording this. Maybe I should go. <laughs> <laughs> but she, uh, she when I got home from work, she tells me, hey, so Douglas had this problem with Tanner, and here's what happened, and and she gave me all this detail about it. Well, my wife and, and Tanner's mom are friends, too, so my wife calls up Tanner's mom and is like, hey, I don't know what happened, and but, you know, apparently he doesn't, he's mad at Tanner for something. So, but it, my point with this story was she had asked these questions in such a way to get the answer that she wanted or what she thought was the problem, and then, they, then, so now you've got my wife and Tanner's mom trying to fix this problem for them to still be friends. And it just wasn't working, wasn't working. Well, so I had the idea of like, I need to try this process with him and see what happens. So I said to my wife, I said, okay, I want to have a conversation with him, but just don't say anything. And, and I said, just, you know, we both just, just let me ask some questions and don't interrupt anything while we're talking just let him talk okay so we sat down with him and I said all right Douglas, so tell me what's going on tell me what's going on with you and Tanner and he starts to talk and I'm like okay what else okay what else okay keep going what else what else? what happened is we finally got what what came out by just actually sitting down and asking him what the problem was because prior to that it was like I don't know I just he just bugs me but as we took him through this, and okay, so tell me what's going on, what, what else, what else. What we found out is they would take the bus home from school, and Tanner would typically, where his house was, was a different bus stop. So same bus, but a different stop. Well, the, my son would get off on the very first bus stop in the neighborhood. So they'd pull into the neighborhood, the bus would stop, my son would get off, and as soon as he got off, he would turn around and Tanner was off the bus too, and would just follow him home. And he just said... I just don't want to play with him every single day, and he didn't even give me a choice. He just got off the bus and follows me home, and then I have to play with him. And I don't always want to play with him right after. Sometimes I just want to come home and talk to you, Mom, first. So my wife, so I said, okay, so what if we did this? What if what we did is, is if, if your mom, so my wife tells Tanner's mom that you can't play right after school. You've got to come home and do a chore first. I threw that in there. <laughs> you got to come home and do a chore first. But then after that, if you want to play with him, then you can get together. Would that work? And he goes, yeah, that would totally work. Fix the problem. So then after that, him and Tanner are friends again. So my point, though, is with that is you can use this. Too many times we assume we know what the issue is, and then we'll ask questions that gets them to give us the answer we're looking for so that we can say, aha, I knew it. I knew that was the problem. When it really doesn't fix the problem. Does that make sense? Okay. So here's what here's what I want to do. So we'll pick up on this. So like I said, we've scratched the surface. This is like, think of this as like a toolbox. Okay. This is tool number one that we've used so far. Okay. We've only used tool number one. And then as I said, there's we're gonna do two passes with this. So think of this. Anybody do woodworking in here? Okay, Rick. So if you were going to sand something, do you start with a coarse sandpaper or a fine sandpaper? Of course. Why? Well, because you need to take the surface down to, to level it out. Okay, good. So once you've done that, then what does the fine sandpaper do? It refines the process. Okay, so think of this, tool number one, as sandpaper. Okay? Is this first time we're going through it, we're using a coarse sandpaper, meaning we want to knock all the rough edges off of it. So what we don't want to do is use... What would happen if you used fine sandpaper before you did the course? The process takes way longer. Okay, good. And it's probably going to tear up the... It, yeah, it's just not going to do the job that needs to be done. Good. So same thing with this. Think of this this way. is like This is like sandpaper, and this first pass is like the course sandpaper. we got to stay out of the way. we got to use the right tool for the right thing. So we're going to do that. Then we'll do a second pass, which is going to be like using this fine sandpaper, and we're going to fine-tune it a little bit, okay? So this is just the first tool. So what we'll do on Thursday is I'll do a little bit of a refresher of some of this stuff. We'll jump into some of this tool number one, but then we're going to, after that, we'll jump, we'll move from here over to tool number two that we're going to use, and we'll, we'll kind of take you through this whole process. So, um, But in the meantime, what I want you to do is 
practice this. So from between now and Thursday, try to get somebody that you can do it with. Now, my preference would be, I'm okay if you want to do it with a spouse, but I would recommend maybe not doing it with your spouse to begin with because what I found, so when I first got trained in it, I came back and I was so excited about it. I remember I told my wife, I gotta show you this process that I learned. And we sat down and I was taking her through the process and she was like, that's weird. That's just weird. And here's what I've learned since then. There was two problems with it. Number one, there's one piece I haven't taught you yet and I skipped that part. So that was the biggest thing. But the second piece of it is, it's like, I like um, coaching and stuff. And like, meaning like, if I'm not like, an expert golfer, but I know a little bit about it. And like, if, if I went golfing with any of you guys, I and some of you probably are way better than me, so I, this may not apply. But like somebody who didn't, I could be like, oh, do this or you need to do that. But like, for whatever reason, like if I try that with my spouse, it just like the relationship's like too close, if that makes sense. And so some of this, I would say, if you try it with a spouse and they're like, that this is just weird, then. Don't judge the process based on that, is what I'm saying. Because I was scared after that. When my wife was like, this is weird. I was like nervous to actually do it with a client. But the, I'll tell you, the first client that I met with after I was trained in this, I sat down with the client. I took them through. Describe for me your ideal home. Now, here's the cool thing with this. After they had, were done with that, we jumped in the car and we, we went out, well, not immediately. I went and said, now let me find some houses for you. So I went and found three houses I was going to take them to. We pull up to the first house, like meaning like park the car. And he was sitting in the front seat. His wife was in the back seat. And he turned around to her and he said, this is it. She's like, I was just thinking that. And I was like, I haven't even been inside the house yet. I mean, what do you mean this is it? So we get out. We walk into the house because I'm like, well, let's go in and see. And we made it the inside. Here's what's funny. Like I'm like trying to convince them not. I'm like, well, let's go inside because maybe it's not so nice inside. So don't you know? Don't judge yet. So we go inside the house and we walk in and they're like, yeah, yep, nope, this is the place. Now I was still a little bit new as an agent. I couldn't believe this was really happening on the very first house. So I'm like, well, we've got three other appointments. We need to go look at those three other houses because we want to make sure that we're getting the right one. Now I would never do that today. Today, if they said this is it, I'd be like, great, let's go back and write the offer. So. We go to the next house and they're like, nope, we still like the other one. I'm like, okay, well, let's go to the third one because part of me is like, well, we have appointments and I don't want to no-show the people and, and, you know, I felt bad or what. Today, I just call and say, hey, sorry, we need to cancel our appointment. We already found the house for them, whatever. So we go to the houses. No, 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 we want the first one. And I even, like, I still even to this day was just, I can't believe how easy that process was. Now, since then, I've done it enough times that I'll tell you that's not going to happen every time. I mean, I, I wish I could tell you that's what would happen is if you take them through this, you'll only go show them one. That's not always going to be the case. But I will tell you, you're going to reduce the number of houses you show big time if you really will get it, figure out. And, and remember, what we're trying to get to the benefits, see? Features have a price tag and benefits don't. I'll, I'll kind of leave you with that to, to sit on until Thursday and we'll pick up on that. But features have a price tag, benefits do not. So you can get the benefit in any price range. And, and as you go out and take the people through this process, you're going to make your job so much easier, similar to what you already saw, by just sitting and listening to them. They are going to feel connected to you, and that it's going to help them to discover what it is they really are looking for in a home to where when you go out to look at it, they're ready to go. Because here's what I'll tell you. Until this happens, nobody's going to buy it until they do it. It won't happen. They will not buy it. So when you've got somebody struggling, you can immediately go, I got, I know what the problem is. We need to sit down and talk. Describe for me what it is that you're looking for. Okay? So practice it. Get some people. Practice, even if it's not real estate, just practice with some people of, hey, tell me about what. And then just try to be quiet. So or I'll use Ryan's word, shut up and just listen, right? Okay. See you on Thursday. Have a good one. Awesome. Thanks, Russ. Yep, you're welcome. Yeah, I want to get that. Oh, yeah.